Well, good morning. Let's stand to our feet. Are you ready to worship Jesus this morning? Praise the Lord. Nobody loves us like Jesus. He has an everlasting and unconditional love, and he is worthy of our praise. Amen. You can come to the front. The altars are open this morning. I got a story too good to hide I was a blind man wandering until I saw the light I got a story I can't deny I'm a living breathing miracle and I just gotta testify Ain't nobody love me like Jesus Ain't nobody love me this good Ain't nobody love me like Jesus And I know, I know, nobody could Tell me who could give me this freedom Tell me who could give me this fun Ain't nobody love me like Jesus And I know, I know, nobody could I'm anointed to bring the news Everything he did for me, I know he'll do for you He gave me joy for the morning, for the ashes of crown I'm a walking, talking miracle and I just gotta let it out Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. Ain't nobody love me this good. Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. And I know, I know, nobody could. Tell me who could give me this freedom. Tell me who could give me this fun. Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. And I know, I know, nobody could. Nobody could pull me from the darkness, save me by the blood, raise me from the ashes. I know, I know, nobody could break off every shackle, tear down every wall, set free every captive. I know, I know, nobody could pull me from the darkness. Save me by the blood, raise me from the ashes. I know, I know, nobody could break off every shackle, tear down every wall, set free every captive. I know, I know, nobody could. Nobody love me like Jesus. Ain't nobody love me this good. Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. And I know, I know, nobody could. Tell me who could give me this freedom. Tell me who could give me this fire. Ain't nobody love me like Jesus. And I know, I know, nobody could. like Jesus. Yeah, hallelujah. hallelujah. that once were chained now lifted high in praise look where I'm standing now 
look where I'm standing now. I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Look where I'm standing now. You carry the cross for me. Now I am a child of the King. Look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now. I stand on the train break. Miracle. The body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. I stand on the chain break, miracle me, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. I stand on the chain.
the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song cause you are Never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let. Down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, you're good. I've 
been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer a slave to fear cause I am a child of God and I'm no longer
blood runs through our veins, God. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we love you. We praise you and we honor you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise to the Lord this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Before you're seated, go around the room and greet somebody. We've got a full house today. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning. It is a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Praise God. I know we have quite a few first-time visitors, so let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you are a first-time visitor, there's a blue connect card in the seat in front of you. If you can fill that out and put it in the offering when we take it up, or you can hand it to me after service. I will be at that white table in the back, and I have a free gift for you, so make sure you stay for your free gift. Thank you for joining us. If you have a church that you do not attend on Sundays, we are encouraging you to pray. See where the Lord leads you, but come here. We love the Lord. We love people. We have a lot of fun, and your life will never be the same. Amen? Well, son, uh, Wednesday night I talked about increase and multiply. That was my message. And the next day we got 50 chairs delivered and they're all going to be filled in Jesus' name. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for increase and multiply. The more people are in the house of the Lord, then the less ground that the devil has. Yeah. Amen. On April 7th, we're going to do a baby dedication. If your baby or your children have never been dedicated to the Lord, Come April 7th, we will call you up to the front. We lay hands on them and pray over them. It's a spiritual blessing upon your children. And then when they get old enough, we get them saved and water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and so on. But we start out with baby dedication. So that will be April 7th, our 1030 service. This afternoon is our Palm Sunday barbecue at 430 out at Jimmy Davis State Park. Let me get my announcements going. 4.30 we will meet. We'll eat around 5.30, 6 o'clock. If you are bringing children for the egg hunt, it's up to age 12. I'm going to separate the groups up to age 5 and then 6 to 12 in another field just so the younger ones can have a chance, right? And I'll need some moms to help me throw a bunch of eggs out. We were supposed to pack 300 eggs. and we went to 400 eggs. We packed over 700 eggs. Golden eggs might have a little something special in it. So you need to be there around 5 o'clock. Do not be late because we don't want any children to show up and be disappointed. Bring your lawn chairs. If you signed up to bring something, please check the back what you signed up for. Make sure you bring it. If you don't bring it, let us know that you're not coming so we're not short on anything. We're going to provide the hamburgers, hot dogs, sodas. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have games. The weather's nice. I declare the sun to come out a little bit in Jesus' name, but thankfully no rain. And we're going to have a good time. We're asking parents with young children to be mindful of your children. I know as a church, we all kind of watch each other's kids, but look, people, it, it's, there's a road, people are backing out, we don't want anyone to get hurt, snakes, there's a lake nearby, so please just be mindful where your kids are, we want everyone to be safe, and besides that, we're going to have a grand old time, amen? Um, next week is Easter, it's a special time to celebrate Jesus, the death and burial and resurrection, let's not forget about the resurrection, right? Yeah. Invite somebody, I have some invites well, give a little wave, Jennifer. What's, what's, what's her name, the one of the Price is Right? What was her name? Vanna White. Look at my Vanna White. <laughs> she, that's my, that, grab what she said. What did I say, Price is Right? Will of Fortune, whatever. <laughs> one of, Vanna White. And so just grab an invite and stick it on someone's car at Walmart. Invite someone. I, hey, I was in Walmart yesterday, and I saw one of our teens that comes on Wednesday. Her family has another church. But on Wednesday, she comes occasionally when she gets a ride. I think she's going to come this afternoon. Anyway, her mom, they got invites from our church at the kids' school. So whoever went to the public school and handed out invites to church, God bless you and thank you. Praise the Lord. So that's next Sunday. Friday night is March, Good Friday, March 29th. We're going to have our one hour of prayer. We meet for one hour the last Friday of the month, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., and we are praying for our nation. I hope you voted yesterday. I voted. Let's vote. It's our right, and that's our freedom. If you don't vote, then you shouldn't be able to complain about it. So we're going to vote, and we're going to pray, and we're going to go out and tell people about Jesus. So come on Friday, March 29th, one hour of prayer. Then next Wednesday, this is my last announcement and I'm done. This coming Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month, we have our Connect Night. Since we're eating together this evening, Connect Night, we're just going to serve ice cream. We're going to do like an ice cream bar with different toppings, worship, an encouraging word. 
And we're going to watch our youth pastors get pied in the face. So if you want to vote, if you want to vote for who you want to get pied in the face, you vote by money. So in a moment when we take up the offering, drop cash in who you would like to see get pied in the face this coming Wednesday. If we reach 1,000 or more, they both get pied in the face. If we reach 2,000 or more, Jeremy and I, and they get pied in the face. So it's going to be a very fun, fun time in Jesus' name. I'm speaking my faith there. I will get pied in the face for Jesus. I don't care. You can throw it all over me. We'll have fun. But I will say this. If you pie me in the face, it might fling back on you. So whoever's name gets drawn, you better watch out. Be careful. You better throw from far because I'm coming. You better come Wednesday. Come on Wednesday. We're going to have a lot of fun. If you like to laugh and have fun, come. We can laugh in church, can't we? Amen. Well, in a moment, we will take up the offering. You can begin to prepare that now, and I'm going to call up Paul Johnson to come encourage us in our giving. Let's give a warm welcome for Paul. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. I'll tell you what, when you worship was, was awesome, and, and when you, as a, as a person, begin to realize that we've been grafted into a vine that we didn't deserve to be a part of, when you get a hold of that, it just it, it can mess you up. And uh, <clears throat> I was sitting there thinking about how good God is to us, um, how we were just grafted into the vine. And, uh, and, and because of that, the, you know, the promises of Abraham that, that Danielle and Pastor have talked about in the past, you've heard us speak when we talk about offering, about what applies to us. And we talk about those things, we believe in them because we are grafted in. And that's an amazing thing that happened there. And because of his love, we're a part of something that we don't deserve. Uh, but we do now. We're part of the family. And uh, so anyway, I'm going to try to encourage you in, in, in uh, this morning. Um, at Grace, we want to build you up. We want to make you stronger. Uh, we want to encourage you. and want to teach you. So I hope something uh, that I'm about to say gives you some encouragement. Uh, Chad and Dante, come stand right in front of this podium for me if you don't mind. I'm kind of I'm kind of throwing something at some guys. They don't know what's going on, but... Yeah. So I asked, uh, I know Dante, he's a friend of mine, he works for me. Y'all can face that way. My guys can see you. No pressure, no pressure. So Dante, he is, uh, he's one of the guys that works for me, a great friend. And Chad, i um, gotten to know him better the more I've been here. And we just happen to have conversations along the way sometimes. And Chad was telling me, he's like, man, I got a membership. Actually, I think this was Mallory that said this. He says, I got a membership of a gym. They were kind of talking about this. But Chad has a membership that he, he don't go. You know, he's got, <laughs> so, so Chad, uh, he's been paying for membership for quite a while. I'm not going to say how long, but <clears throat> he doesn't use that membership. Now, Dante, on the other hand, has a membership at the gym, and he goes. And last week, I think it was, show me that bicep, Dante. Come on, do a little flex for us. All right, so last week, Dante hit like 350, so he's doing pretty good. He's benching 350 pounds. Chad, how much you bench? <laughs> so, so anyway, I know we got a laugh at this. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Y'all can y'all can sit down. <clears throat> so you know, sometimes we talk about things, and we get we're gonna we're gonna talk about some verses. But you could be like Chad, or you could be like Dante in the physical. We can choose to apply some words uh, that we hear and and let them grow our knowledge in our mind, and we use them and we exercise and we get stronger, or we could have a membership to a church and not do anything with it. And then we're going to stay the same. So um, I just wanted to pick at Chad a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, pull up Proverbs 4, 20 through 23 for me. Um, it says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes and keep them in the midst of your heart. For they, will, they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The, the word encourages us to pay, to pay attention to what it has to say. So in Proverbs, the writer was telling us to pay attention to the words uh, in, in the Bible. Um, we've all heard, well, most of you guys have been a part of grace, have heard Malachi 3, 10, and 11 a bunch. We've talked about Malachi 3.10s and what the blessing is. And what God says there is a challenge to those of us who give. It says, um, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. 
And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out you such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit, for you are in the field, says the Lord of hosts. So what God's saying there to us is if, if we test him in these things, he's going he's gonna to fill our our barns, our savings account, and, and the things that we put our hands to, he's going to bless. So he's going to bless those things, but who does he bless that for? Who's he doing this for? Is it just anybody who applies it? No, it's not just anybody. It's, it's to his children that he's talking to. So you've heard it said a bunch, if you've been here, Galatians 3, 26 and 29 talks about the promises of Abraham and why you and I have access to that same promise. Uh, Galatians three twenty six and 29 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither free, neither slave nor free. And there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed. So he's saying that if we, not just people who say they're Christians, but those who are, who follow Christ, who put on Christ, who begin to look more like Christ, who follow him, then they are, you are, you and I are Abraham's seed. And we're heirs according to that promise, to the blessing of Abraham. And we could talk, I, this is a lot more information than I'm going to sit here and take into pastor's time this morning, but we, the promise of Abraham, he is, it, is, it is a great promise. You want to be a part of that. And, and that's, that's why we, you know, I want to point to that. There's so many people that kind of do talk bad about the prosperity and prosperity like it's a bad thing. But if you're a, a child of God, he wants you to prosper. He wants you to be blessed. He desires for us to be blessed. And so we have this bad image sometimes of blessing. We're kind of scared of it. Don't be scared of Abraham's promise. Don't be, because he wants us to be blessed. What good father does not want to bless his children? So our Father in heaven wants to bless us. But I wanted to lay out some things. You've got to follow Christ. You've got you to follow Christ. We don't just know him. There's a lot of, I mean, demons and spirits know there is a God. Uh, but we have to know and follow Christ. And so that following Christ looks like something. Uh, so what might hinder blessings as a Christian? What might hinder the blessings from flowing to you? There are several things that would, would hinder the blessing to flow to you. Uh, sin, doubt, unbelief, fear, um, maybe lack of knowledge. All of those things can hinder a blessing. But I want to talk about one thing about sin and how sin can affect things. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm being quick, and I know I'm jumping around some things, but I want to talk about Joshua uh, in, in the book of Joshua in chapter 6. It talks about the Battle of Jericho. Now, a lot of people have heard of the Battle of Jericho, but the Battle of Jericho is when uh, the Jews went into the Promised Land to take it over. Uh, this is where they went in. They marched around the city. They were given very specific things as they did this, and they went in, marched around a city, and the, a great defeat of a giant fortified city was given to God's children. But it was very specific things were given. So there were, there were rules. There were things that were said to don't take and to take. And someone within the city, within the, the, the children of, of Israel, they, they took something they weren't supposed to. And so sin entered into the camp. Then there was a battle in, in Joshua 7 where they were going back out to another battle to take on another city. And they were defeated. And it was a small city. So something bad had happened. So this great victory had happened, and all of a sudden they were defeated on a small, what they thought was a small battle. And it was because of sin. The hand of God had come off, off of them, and then all of a sudden there was defeat. And that sin caused that. So when we sin, there is a consequence to it. Uh, so as we follow Christ and as we give and as we, as we move forward in, in our walk, we're going to have, I have a feeling that there are people out here, I know there is, that you've got ideas, you've got things that are going on, there's business stuff happening. So as you do those things, honor the Lord all the way through. 
Don't get started. See, I, I've lived this. I've made some mistakes, and I've seen the blessing of God and his hand come up off of me. And I've seen myself lose some battles. But then God's hand rests back on me again. When I realized the sin that I was walking in and the things that I did, and then I've seen God bless me again. And, and that is just part of my testimony. But I can tell you, just as it says in the Word, it is true. And so be aware. Um, in <clears throat> You don't have to put this up, but in Matthew, it encourages us that if we have anger in us against another brother or sister, it says, before you present an offering to the Lord, lay that offering at the altar and go make it right with your brother. So I just want to point to a couple of things. Don't let sin, don't let anger, don't let things stop the blessing of God from flowing to you as you give. So today as we give, analyze yourself as a Christian and say, do I have things right? If not, confess that sin to your, to your Father in heaven. Do I have a problem between me and a brother before I go and give an offering? If not, make that right. Because the blessing of God is for you and it is good. And, and it's not something to be ashamed of. So as you give today... I pray that you would just take those things and apply them. So. Amen, amen. Well, at this time you may come up and bring your, your tithes, your offerings to the Lord. There's some different ways to give. You can give by cash. You can give by check. If you give by check, make sure you make it out to Grace Community Church. You can give online by going to gracejonesboro.com forward slash give. You can also text to give. Uh-oh. Today's the last day to vote with your money. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, Lord, bless everything that was given today. Lord, bless your people. Bless your people, your children, Lord, may they multiply and have an abundance for every good thing in their life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. and amen. How are we doing today, church? Great. I've been studying on revival all week. It's 11.09. How much time do we have today? As long as it takes. I am fired up. I was thinking... You know, we need, to be, we need to make sure that we don't treat the things of God lightly. The, the, the precious word of God coming to church, and, and not just coming to church, but becoming the church. God doesn't want you to just be a good little Christian that goes to church and will go to heaven when you die. He wants you to become his house where he lives his life in and through you, where heaven's blessing flows to you, in you, and through you to the world around you. Amen. You're not meant to live a static Christian life. You are meant to live a very dynamic Christian life to change the world, to turn the world upside down. Amen. But in order to do that, you have to encounter God. And God is holy. He is holy. The angels in heaven, they sing a song for all of eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And guess what? They're not looking to write a new song. Because the same old song that they've been singing applies. And it's just as awesome as the last bit of eternity that they've been singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
They're not bored in heaven. They're not going, holy, holy, holy. They go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And they throw down their crowns before God because they see just how awesome God is. You need to see how awesome God is. Listen, there's an invite, and it's not to come to religion. It's to come to encounter God Almighty. He is holy. He is awesome. You could study for all of eternity and never just even rise above the basics of finding out all that God is. He is that awesome. Hallelujah. And he's calling people unto himself. This is the hour to run to Jesus. Church, this is the hour. If there's any unbelievers, I'm calling you today to come to Jesus. Because if your hope is in this nation or it's in the federal government, guess what? We as a nation, the federal government is going off of a cliff. Why do I say that? Because when you look to the federal government, you look at what's happening in Washington, D.C. They just passed a spending bill, $1.2 trillion. They had to borrow it, I don't know from who, maybe China. But every 100 days, the federal government is borrowing a trillion dollars. Why? So they could pay for things. What kind of things? And remember, this is your tax money. This is your money. This is what you are paying for. This is what Mike Johnson just signed off on. The Speaker of the House. It includes funding for abortion facilities. Aren't you glad you're paying for that? LGBT activist centers. These are centers that disciple people in LGBTQ whatever else. That carry out transgender injections. Aren't you glad you're paying for that? Uh, target, they target minors. They hold drag, uh, drag queen shows. And they help illegal immigrants who identify as gay or transgender to gain U.S. citizenship. One congressman, Roy Chip, said that this bill is an abomination. So we're borrowing money from God knows who to pay for these things. So when you look, the federal government is going on off of a cliff. And they don't even talk about it. There might be a couple of folks talking about it. So if your hope is in that, what, what are you going to do when the federal government just totally collapses and crumbles? Which it will. But guess what? I'm unafraid. My hope is not in that. God's got me and God's got the church. So this is the hour to get into the church because God's hand is on the church. I am unmoved by what's happening in Washington. I'm only moved by heaven and heaven's agenda. And God is raising up a church, a glorious bride. And listen, you want to be part of a faith church. It matters what church you go to. Because in some churches they teach the sovereignty of God. And if it be God's will, maybe you'll get healed. People lean on that. For so many things, it's a a Calvinistic concept and and idea, the sovereignty of God. The reason I'm not on fire for God is maybe because God doesn't want me to be on fire because he controls everything. It matters what church you become a part of. I want to encourage you to become a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Find the church that preaches the word. Find the church that is baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost during this hour. You need the Holy Ghost 
in this hour. You need to hear from God very clearly. And the Holy Spirit is the agent on earth right now. And Holy Spirit is not a goosebump. He's not a cloud. He is the Lord. He is God. He's not an it. He is God. He is Lord. Amen. Amen. God's doing something in America. And it, it's, it's time that we, the church, we just zoom out. We back up a little bit and we begin to see. We, we, we look and we see what God has been doing in America for over 200 something years. You know, we look and we see wickedness all around us today. But this isn't the first time that America has been in a state of moral decay. But there's been times and seasons where the church has begun to contend. They begin to pray and cry out to God. And God would pour out his spirit on this nation so much so that it began to change and affect all of society. I want to talk to you today about that. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Acts. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Verse 1. And it happened while... Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to a city that's called Ephesus. And finding some disciples, these were disciples who had been trained by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was pointing the way to Jesus. He was saying that there was one coming after me who was mightier than him and that he would come and baptize people in the Holy Ghost and in fire. And finding some disciples, that's Paul, he found some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I want to ask you, believer, have you received the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Because the Holy Spirit is the key to walking in everything that Jesus paid for. The Holy Spirit is the key to walking in the fullness of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is the key to walking out of sin and walking into freedom. If you need deliverance, if you need healing, if you need power to walk as an overcomer, Holy Spirit is the power of God that Jesus gives to his church so that we can walk in healing. We can walk in signs and wonders. We can walk as overcomers. So did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I know that there are churches, there are denominations that teach against the Holy Spirit. They say that the the moving of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, the signs and wonders that ended with the time of the apostles. You have to be very careful in how you approach the Holy Spirit. If you will reject, if you reject the Holy Spirit, he will back up. And listen, what America needs right now is the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to be very careful when it comes to the things of the Holy Spirit. There was a man named Jonathan Edwards who preached mightily back in the 1700s. He used to spend 18 hours in prayer before he ministered. 18 hours. And as he began to preach, he preached this message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, how many of you know that God's not angry? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves the world. He sees all the wickedness taking place, but you know what? He loves them. And so even though Jonathan Edwards didn't have 
the right message. He had the wrong doctrine, so to speak. God saw that Jonathan Edwards was hungry for him. And so while he was preaching, as he began to preach, people began to have visions of hell. And they thought it was real. Like while he was preaching, they had visions and they saw the flames of hell and literally thought it was coming to consume them. So they held on to their pews. They held on to the posts in the room crying out. And you couldn't even really hear Jonathan Edwards preach because the screams were so loud. Do you know what began to take place? Everybody out in the community was talking about God. Everybody became eternally minded. They were all thinking about eternity. Everywhere you went in society, everybody was talking about God. But as the Holy Spirit continued to move, he began to move outside of visionary experiences to the point where people were beginning to speak in tongues and they were, they were, the gifts of the Spirit began to flow. And Jonathan Edwards, he stood And he opposed it. And guess what? The move of God began to wane. Revival began to wane. The Holy Spirit began to step back. You've got to receive God. You've got to receive his power. He is Lord. It doesn't matter what you've been taught. This is the word of God. The power of God, the gifts of the Spirit did not end with the time of the apostles. I've seen things with my own eyes. If you believe that things ended with the time of the apostles, show me scripture and verse. You can't. You got to make that up. It doesn't fit the scriptures. And it doesn't fit what's happened all throughout history. In every century, the power of God has been on display. Amen. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and without going through a 10-hour teaching trying to convince them uh, on the doctrine of speaking in tongues, the Bible says, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. So Paul found 12 men. And what did he go after? Getting them baptized in the Holy Ghost. That was the mission of the early church, not to just get people saved so that they go to heaven when they die. They sought to get them baptized in the Holy Spirit so that they had power to transform the world. Only transformed people can transform the world. And you are meant to transform the world. That's why you are a new creation as a believer. You're not just a believer. You are a brand new creation. Jesus was the prototype. You've been made by the design of the prototype. When you study Jesus, Jesus spoke and things happened. He spoke to a tree and it shriveled up and died. He spoke to wind and waves and they obeyed him. He spoke to demons and they ran away. He spoke to sickness and disease and healed people. He spoke to his bride, the church, and raised them up. And so Paul, he had 12 disciples that were now filled with the Holy Spirit. 
What did he do with these 12 disciples? It says, and he went into the synagogue, and when they had come to him, he said to them, my bad. He went into the synagogue, and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when they were hardened, and did not believe, because he was preaching to the multitudes, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So he had these 12 disciples, and he started a Bible school. And basically for two years, he began to minister to these 12 disciples. And it says, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul spent two years teaching 12 men that led to everyone in Asia hearing the word of God. You know, it really only takes one person to say yes to God. Paul was one man that obeyed God, that in many respects was rejected by the apostles. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. First of all, he was killing Christians, and the apostles just stayed away from him. But thank God they sent Barnabas to go and be with Paul, formerly known as Saul, and he spent some time with him and discipled him. And Paul became a disciple of Jesus Christ, and he got a revelation from heaven. And with that revelation from heaven, he went and he turned the world upside down. You need revelation from heaven. One person with revelation from heaven can transform the world. All it takes is one person saying yes to God. You ever read the story of Jonah? How God called him to go to Nineveh? And he didn't want to go. He ran in the opposite direction. God told him to go and speak to Nineveh, the Ninevites there. This was a wicked city. It was like 60 miles long. This was a huge city. It was wicked. And Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't want to see God have mercy on those people. But God was going to bring judgment to Nineveh. So he tells Jonah to go. Jonah goes in the opposite direction, and God had his own little way of getting Jonah to go to Nineveh. Finally, Jonah wises up, sitting in the belly of a whale, and he says, Lord, I'll go. God gives him this message. This is the message. We think that we have to have this doctorate in theology in order to be used by God. He, he says, go and speak the word that I tell you. This was his message. In 40 days, this city is going to be destroyed. Period. Like, that's it. That was the message. He walks into Nineveh, and that's all he says. In 40 days, this nation is going to be destroyed. I would want something else. I, you know, I, I like, come on, give me a whole message. In 40 days, this nation is going to be destroyed. And everybody, including the king, even the animals, repent. I mean, they, they, they're fasting. The animals are fasting. And God has mercy on the Ninevites, and they're spared. All it takes is one person to change a nation. It took one man for the city of Nineveh to come to God. All it takes is one of us to catch the flame, to catch the fire. Jesus met a a woman by the well, and he began to read her mail. And he said, you know, you have had five husbands. In other words, you've been divorced five times. And the man that you're with now, you're not even married to. And she said, you know, when Jesus, or sorry, when the Messiah comes, he's going to fix all these issues. And he says, 
I who speak to you am the Messiah. And you know what? She went back to her city. This woman who had been divorced five times. What excuse do you have? Because everybody has them. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm the wrong color. I'm rich, too rich. I'm too poor. I'm from Jonesboro. I'm from Bill Platt. We all have excuses. This woman, she went back to her city and she led her entire city to Jesus. God is looking for one person that will say, Lord, I'll be your mouthpiece. God, I'll be your hands. Lord, I'll be your feet. Just use me. Just use me. You know, in the altar calls way back in the day when I was growing up, they would call people, who, who wants to be used by God? People would flood the altars. Use me, God. We need to come back to that place where people want to be used by God once again. Thank God for the blessing, and we will preach that. We will preach prosperity. But look, we need a desire to be used by God. When we look all around us, there's areas of brokenness. The streets are broken. And listen, you carry the hope of the nations. You carry the one who can restore nations. It only takes one. It only takes one. What do I preach? Jesus said to preach the message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? God's healing power, his deliverance power is not far off. His kingdom, the power of it, it's right here and it's right now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. One man made 12 disciples and all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Why is that? Because when you preach the word, signs, wonders, and miracles follow. If you will preach the word, you don't have to go to Bible school. You don't have to go to cemetery, I mean seminary. <laughs> just, just get in the word. Find out what Jesus preached. Find out what the apostles preached. Preach that. That's the message. The message has not changed. If you'll stick to that message, you'll find signs, wonders, and miracles will follow you. Hallelujah. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Isn't that amazing how the anointing of God, it's, it's tangible and it is transferable. Paul was an apostle. He was planting churches in different Places. And so some of the places, like Ephesus, he was starting from the ground up. So he, he didn't have a salary as a pastor, so to speak. So he's out there on, on the edge, planting churches. And he's, he's making tents. And he begins to take these aprons, these handkerchiefs, and he would give them to people. Here, go take this to this sick person. Go take this to this person that has a demon. And when they, when they gave it to the person with the demon or the person that was sick, demons would flee. See, this is power. This is the power of God on display. Somebody has to display the power of God. The church is meant to display the power of God. The church is not supposed to be good religious people. We're supposed to be a people of power. Amen. Every man, every woman, young and old, every child 
is to be used by God. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So these were religious people. They didn't know Christ. They weren't born again. They were religious folks. And they saw that the apostle Paul, when he cast out, when he used the name of Jesus, demons would flee. So they thought, well, we can, we can do the same. We'll just take Jesus' name like Paul's using, and we'll say this. We exercise you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. Let's see where it got them. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know... And Paul I know, but who the heck are you? That's the Jeremy version. Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You see, religion doesn't cut it. There is no power in religion there is no power in just calling yourself a christian there's no power in just going to a church there's no power in just reading the bible as some sort of religious ritual you've got to be born again religion is not going to fix this nation. Born-again believers who carry the authority of God on the inside of them. They know who they are in Christ. They, they're carriers of the power, and they use the name of Jesus like power of attorney. Like, when the believer shows up, it's as if Jesus showed up. When we say, leave, demon... In Jesus' name, it's as though Jesus himself were saying it. Religion is not going to fix this nation. There are demons all over this nation. They're in Hollywood. They're in Congress. They're in the executive branch. They sit on school boards. They are teachers in public education. And professors, what do you think causes a school board to make laws where a teenager that feels like they are the opposite sex, they don't have to tell their parents that they feel that way? And so the school deems the parents as unsafe. So you have a, a, a counselor at school that you could confide in. And they can get you on all the right medications. They, they can get you into the endless cycle of big pharma. That's demonic. There's demons everywhere. Where's demons? They're everywhere. But only the church who operates in the power of God will have the ability to stop. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine these seven guys? We exercise you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And one man rips off all their clothes, all seven of them, beats them up, and they run for the hills. What happens? This story became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing 
and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That's the equivalent of six million dollars. Imagine the magic book publishers. You think they took a dent, a hit in their business? Do you think that they were happy about that? I don't imagine so. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Verse 21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Now about that time, there arose a great commotion, that's a disturbance, that's trouble began to brew about the way. The way is the church. They preached that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And so they were known as the people, the way. So the church was the way, they were called. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana. Now, most of you have probably never seen little shrines. We lived in Cambodia. There were shrines everywhere. In every business, in every house that we would go to, they had a shrine. They had the little fat Buddha, you know, that would just kind of hang there. He had his belly out. He was gold. He had food all around him. And in Cambodia, it's big business to sell shrines. Well, it was big business in Ephesus and in Asia to sell these silver shrines of the goddess Diana, which was the goddess of fertility. And she was worshipped all over Asia. And so he begins to complain, and he said this business, it, it brought a, a huge uh, profit to the craftsmen. So he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul, this little Christian, he is persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is, it, is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute or into bankruptcy, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana uh, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And basically what happens after this is a riot begins to take place and Paul has to run for his life, and as they taught us on the mission field, you know, sometimes you got to run away today to preach the gospel another day. But Paul left behind a church in Ephesus, and you can actually go and read the book of Ephesians, which the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, and this was a church that was on fire. That's why when you read the book of Ephesians, it's different from some of the other letters that are in the New Testament. He, Paul was writing to a church that was on fire. And so I said all that to say this, that Paul, he went to Ephesus and basically he started a revival with 12 men. And people begin to confess their sins. They begin to turn to Christ. But this revival began to touch the nation. And when that takes place, what you call that is an awakening. Now, when an awakening takes place in a nation, very often there's a whole lot of persecution that, that coincides with the moving of God. And what we're seeing in our nation is a great awakening take place. That's why there's such a fight. 
There is such a battle taking place. They want to censor and silence the church. They are afraid of you opening your mouth and speaking the truth. They don't want truth. They don't want God in the public square. But I'm telling you, now is the time for the church to speak up and to speak out and to take the land and take ground and heal the sick and cast out devils and raise people from the dead. Now's the time to buy businesses. I'm telling now's the time to buy businesses. Now's the time to buy land. Because when this whole thing crumbles, I believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be right there to pick up this nation and put it back on course for the destiny, purpose, and plan that God has for this nation. Listen, when we look back over the past 200 and something years, God has poured out His Spirit on this nation. There have been movements that have taken place. There's been great awakenings that have taken place at times in our history when America was in moral uh, bankruptcy. How many of you have heard of the Methodist denomination? You know, you, you look at where they're at today, it's a far cry from what they were. John and Charles Wesley. John Wesley... He went on horseback for hundreds of thousands of miles. This man would preach everywhere he went. They wouldn't let him in churches. They would not accept John Wesley in churches. So he went out to the streets to preach the gospel. And they had a method by which they sought God. They had a method by which they would evangelize. And I think if we'll just look back to our spiritual heritage, our spiritual history, we'll figure out and find out how to win this nation back to God. The Methodists, they had a method of going into a region and knocking on every door and presenting the gospel to every single person to give them an opportunity to hear and make a decision. Something happens when you begin to knock on doors and ask people where they will spend eternity. And we're going to have an opportunity to do that here on April 13th. It's a Saturday. God is giving Grace Community Church a, a huge opportunity in that we are going to gather pastors from this community. We're going to meet right here April 13th on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. I've got a meeting with some of these guys Uh, This coming Thursday, we're going to lay out the details. But we're gathering churches. Think about this. You remember the mayor? Last year, we had murders taking place in our city. We hadn't had any murders here recently. And I believe it's because the church came together. The mayor, he called on leaders in the community. He called upon church leaders especially and said, I need you to do something about this. You know, really, only the church can do something about this. And so he gathered us together. We had a unity service back in January. How many of you remember that? The presence of God poured out on that place of fire uh, began. Amen. And so the fire is going to continue. So we're going to go out. We're going to knock on doors and we're going to ask people, if you died today, where would you spend eternity? When you ask that question and put eternity in the minds and hearts of people, that acts as a restraining order to the devil. They're going to think twice before they grab a weapon and just carelessly take somebody's life. And so we're going to do that, just like the Methodists did way back when, when they started churches all over this country. And God raised up men and women How many of you ever heard of George Whitfield? God would send these people from Great Britain, like George Whitfield. He was another one. He's kicked out of the church in England. They wouldn't let him in the churches. So he went out to the streets, and he would preach in the public squares. He went to Boston Common, and he preached to 30,000 people. This is back in like the 1700s. There was no 
megaphone. There was no microphone system. Benjamin Franklin was so impressed by George Whitfield. He had, a, he had kind of a, a lazy eye, but dude could preach. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin was so impressed by his ability to preach to 30,000 people and everyone could hear him crystal clear. How do you do that? Benjamin Franklin said that, he said, you know, I'm not going to bring any more money when I go to George Whitfield's meetings because he'd be in the meetings and he'd hear George Whitfield talking about how he was going to start an orphanage and, and Benjamin Franklin would put in a copper coin and then he'd put in another one and then another one and next thing you know, he's emptying all his pockets. So he said, well, I'm not going to bring any more money to George Whitfield's meetings. But God would convict Benjamin Franklin. George Whitfield, the, the whole idea of these states being united, that came from, what's his name, George? No, the one I was just talking about. Whitfield. Whitfield. George Whitfield. He, he was like the father of the idea of these states being united. Think about that. That came from a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people all over this nation began to turn to Christ. They began to open places like Princeton University where they would train pastors to go out onto the prairie to take the gospel all over this nation. Think about that. That this is our spiritual heritage. Amen. This is your spiritual heritage. Great awakening took place in this nation. Anybody ever hear of the Cane Ridge revival? This was in Kentucky. Now, Kentucky was not part of the original you know, 13 colonies. And a lot of people that were on the east when they got in trouble with the law, they became outlaws and bandits. They would go to Kentucky. Kentuckians were a rough group of people. They were homesteaders. They were explorers. And there was a man named James McGreedy. And he called his churches to fast and pray every Saturday and Sunday morning. They did that for four years. And he decided to have a communion service for like four or five days in a row. And when they had the communion service, all of a sudden the power of God began to manifest. And guess what happened? People began to laugh. People began to shake. People began to quake. You know, we, we see what happens in the church today. Sometimes our services, they get a, a little rowdy. We see the Holy Spirit moving and you think that's something new? No. That's been around since the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. When those on the outside came and they looked at the church and they said, are these people drunk? Hallelujah. This is our spiritual heritage. That's your spiritual heritage. That's your spiritual heritage. I don't have so much a, a sermon to preach today, but I want to remind you, what God did in the past is something that he'll do again today. Amen. If he could find a hungry people, if he could find a people that will seek God, that will fast and pray and go out into the highways and byways and proclaim the name of the Lord, we'll see this nation saved again. Yeah. Look, let me read some things to you because, you know, when you look at Washington, it could be discouraging. So we got to zoom out a little bit. Look at some of the things that are taking place. These are some wins. Bills are being put forth by 16 states, including Florida, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, to allow children with the consent of parents to have access to chaplains in public schools. 
Florida and Louisiana have already passed this bill. In the 30,000 schools that have chaplains, not one of those schools had a suicide. Now, you may not hear this a lot, but suicide is rampant with our young people. You know, when they shut down the school, kids were at home, left to their own devices, so to speak. All of a sudden, suicide skyrocketed. Check this out. Eight states are considering legislation to put the Ten Commandments back in schools. One state, Texas, almost passed a requirement that would make every school classroom have the Ten Commandments posted. So just the fact that they're considering that is amazing. In Utah, they passed the bill where the Ten Commandments, along with the Constitution, are being taught in public schools. So what's going to happen when the federal government totally collapses is we're going to realize just how much power the states have. And that's what's happening. That's what's been so amazing to see what's taking place in some of these Republican-led states. They know their authority. They know their rights as states. We are United States, but we are individual states with individual constitutions. Amen. Amen. And so that's a good thing. So when the federal government collapses... We're going to have the states to fall back on. And I'm so thankful for states like Texas, states like Louisiana, states like uh, Florida, Alabama, that they have a, a strong governor in those places. Check this out. Texas is joining Georgia, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and more than 15 other states in prioritizing America's fiscal priorities over the left's political agenda with Uh, a historic move. Texas pulls $8.5 billion from BlackRock in a stunning blow to the ESG movement. Now, if you've never heard of BlackRock, they have about $10 trillion worth of assets. And they are buying up homes and real estate all over the United States, really all over the world, but all over the United States because They want the American citizens to be renters. They don't want you to own anything. You remember the the, the 2030 agenda? Uh, You won't own anything, but you'll be happy. Well, who would own it? BlackRock. Uh, No, thank you. So I'm telling you, the devil is anointing companies like this to do what they're doing because the devil knows that the promise is to the seed of Abraham that you would have land, the promised land. That's why I'm telling you now is the time to get in business. Listen, Planet Fitness, I don't know if you've you've read that story, but there was a man in the women's bathroom shaving. A young girl walked out, saw this man. She's freaked out by it. Another older lady saw what was going on, told the man, hey, you got a dude part, you got to get out of here. And uh, basically, Planet Fitness, you know, went with the the trans dude. And so now there's a whole lot of pushback. They've taken a big hit, $400 million. People are like, okay, so this is what you're going with? Well, we're going to vote with our money. I'm waiting for somebody in the church to make the Lord's gym. Uh, Now's the time to start a Christian business. Because Christians are getting very serious about this war that we're in. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to have weapons? That basically, our checkbook, this is our weapon. So, now's the time to fight. I don't know how Christians could, could continue to support Disney. I'm just going to put that out there. You realize that Disney, it's a pedophilia company. They're into human trafficking. So when you go and you spend your money at Disney, you are supporting human trafficking. Like little kids going into the sex slave trade. That's where your money's going if you spend money with Disney. That's what you're supporting. So I want to challenge you. 
as a pastor, take your money and support good companies. You may want to start the next whatever, Disney. Let's make our own. All right, I'll move on. <laughs> States are taking on the censorship industrial complex before the Supreme Court. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. But I want to remind you, remember back in June of, of 2020, 20, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. That's a huge win. And I know that in many churches, they didn't even mention it. They're afraid to talk about abortion. How many of you know in the church, we need to talk about these issues? And it's not to condemn anybody if you've had an abortion. If you've asked for forgiveness, God forgives you. But it really wounds women that have abortions. They carry that for life. So there's forgiveness there, but... We as the church, we need to have language. We need to see abortion come to an end. And many states are passing laws to ban abortion. Amen. And that's exciting to see. Yeah. Coach Joe Kennedy, how many of you remember reading that story? His case, he, had, he would pray after the, the, the football game at the high school. And finally the school, they suspended him. And then they fired him for going out on the field after a football game and saying a quiet prayer. The people were offended, those that were in charge of the school, they were offended that somebody would go out in the field and pray in public. That was the key issue. So they don't want Christians praying in public. Well, that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court sided with him. Amen. So I want to let you know there's some some wins that are taking place. Momsforliberty.com, you can go to that. These are moms that are going into school boards and they're basically voting out these school board members and they're becoming a part of the school boards and they're standing for their children, for the rights of parents. Who would, I mean, can you believe here we are where we're having to fight for the rights of parents to parent their own children. So groups like this are forming all over the country. And if you're unaware of Charlie Kirk and TPUSA, he's going around the country to different colleges, and he's debating with leftists. You can find his stuff all over YouTube, uh, Rumble, all the different social media sites, Facebook, uh, Reels and, and Shorts and all that bit. Go and check out. Uh, young people, I want to encourage you because this is your nation too. Begin to listen to Charlie Kirk. Begin to listen to uh, Candace Owens. Candace Owens is awesome. They are so articulate in their ability to, to state the issues of our time. So I want to encourage you to listen to people. Don't, don't watch Fox. Uh, <laughs> if you watch Fox, if you watch MSNBC, CNN, None of that's real. That's all fake. It's fake. It's all Operation Mockingbird, which the CIA controls all the narrative. They're all parrots. They all say the same thing that the government told them to say. There's no real journalism taking place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a great awakening, a great awakening is taking place in our nation. It's happening. It's happening. You know, in the first and second great awakening, they didn't know an awakening was happening until 10, 20, 30 years later. Like, wow, things have been shifting for decades now. And that's what's happening in our nation. So you have your place. You have your part in this great awakening. I believe in the years to come, should Jesus tarry, we're going to see the effects of this thing. It's going to ripple throughout the world. Amen. 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 And we get to be a part of it. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
If you don't know Jesus, he wants you to know him. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And if you're here in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to challenge you. I want to ask you the question. If you died today, where would you spend eternity? Eternity is forever. And there's no, um, what do the Catholics call it? Purgatory. There's no holding cell after this life where you could hope that enough people on this side of life would pray you out of purgatory and maybe you'd go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you have to do something about it on this side of life. By default, every human being is automatically on their way to hell. And it's because the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, that were on earth, they sinned. They disobeyed God. They introduced sin into this world. We live in a fallen world. Mankind is fallen and needs a Savior. You need a Savior. Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life. If you haven't, He will give you an abundant life. He will forgive all your sins. He'll give you a brand new identity. You'll become righteous in the eyes of God. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you're not sure where you would go, after you died. I want to do something with you. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in a prayer that we call the sinner's prayer. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Jeremy, I would like for you to pray with me. I want to get right with God. I want the Lord to forgive my sins. I want to become a brand new creation. I want to enjoy this relationship with God that you're, you're describing. If that's you and you're here in this room, I want you to do something very brave. Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before men, then I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you reject me before people, then I'm going to reject you before my Father in heaven. Would you receive Jesus in a public way today? If so, you say, that's me. And I want you to raise your hand right now. Anybody? I see that hand. Thank you. I see those two hands. Anybody else? You say, that's me. I want to I get saved. I want to be made right with God. Anybody? Come on. Come on. Don't let this moment pass you by. Listen, tomorrow is not promised to you. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody else? God loves you. God loves you. Say yes to him today. Anybody else? I see that hand back there. Anybody else? Anyone? Listen, hell is hot. Eternity is forever. God doesn't want you in hell. He wants you to spend eternity with him in paradise. Anybody else? Those of you that raised your hand, I want you to just take one more step. I want you to come to the front. I want to pray with you. Come up to the front. Come on up. Come on, church. <laughs> Hallelujah. They just stand facing me. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, Miss Destiny. That's awesome. Come on up here, Henry. Praise God. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This prayer 
does not save you. If you will pray this prayer in faith, you have to have faith that what you're saying, it touches the heart of God. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that Jesus rose from the dead and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we will be saved. As we pray this prayer, you are going to become a brand new creation. You're going to be made right with God. What's going to happen is God's going to take the sin that you've carried, that heavy weight of sin. He's going to remove it from you, and he's going to give as a gift to you his righteousness. Wow. So you're going to be made right with God, not because of something you've done. You've just placed your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross. This is amazing. Today is your day. Are you ready for this? All right. As I pray, I'm going to lead you. I want you to repeat after me. I want you to remember you're, you're praying to God the Father. So say it aloud. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says that if I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, and if I confess with my mouth, and if I with my mouth that, Jesus Lord, that Jesus is Lord, I will be saved. I will be saved. So, today, so today, I declare, I declare that, I believe that I believe Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus rose from the dead. And, that and that he is Lord of my life. Of my life. I, ask I ask you to forgive me, to forgive me for, all my sins. for all my sins. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Make me a brand new creation. Today, I am born again. I am a child of God. I declare my faith in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Stay right there. Hallelujah. Now let me pray for you. Church, would you extend your hands towards them? Heavenly Father, we lift up these three individuals today and we welcome them into the very family of God. Lord, I pray that your precious Holy Spirit would come upon them now, fill them up to overflowing, baptize them in the Holy Ghost, and in fire I pray from this day on they would never turn from you but they would live for you each and every day of their life Lord I pray that you give them a hunger for your word a hunger for relationship with you a hunger for connection with the church a hunger to find their purpose that you have specifically assigned to each and every one of them and that they would never be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay right here. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you to get plugged into a church. The devil does not like what just happened. So the first thing he's going to try to do is get you out of church. Because he knows that in this environment, you're going to grow and become all that God's going to call, call you to be. And he doesn't want that. He does not want you to be taught. He doesn't want you to know who you are in Christ. He's very afraid of that. So this is a place where we train and equip people like you to be like Jesus. All right? So find a church home. Get rooted and grounded in a church home. This is a good church, so I'm encouraging you to come here, all right? Get into the scriptures. Read the Word of God. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and begin to build relationship with people and enjoy this newfound relationship that you have with the Lord. Begin to pray. You don't have to pray in a very fancy way. I'm like, good morning, Lord. How's heaven doing? 
I'm serious. I, I'm just, just very real with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Yay. Awesome. My brother. Hallelujah. Well, church, we will see you tonight at the park. Y'all have a good afternoon.